Welcome to session 45 of the World of Speculative Fiction series. This time we're going to be looking at two novels which are connected but quite different by the same author. A Canticle for Leibowitz, which many of you have probably read by Walter M. Miller Jr. If you haven't read it already, you're definitely going to want to get it. And then the follow-up to it, which came many decades later, St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horse Woman, which actually was not completely written and finished by Walter Miller. We'll talk about that in a moment. He did, in fact, have a ghostwriter who, who helped him out with the process and finished it up after Walter Miller's death. So it is, in a certain respect, a posthumous novel rather than one written in his own lifetime, or rather one published in his lifetime. It was all pretty much written within his lifetime. And the world that's being depicted by these is is quite a rich one, as we're going to discuss. So Worlds of Speculative Fiction is a series that I started five years ago, partnering with the Brookfield Public Library here in the greater Milwaukee area. It was originally a face-to-face -face session. We've recorded all of the sessions, and you can watch previous ones. And in each of them, what I would do is come in and give a bit of a talk, and we'd do a lot of, you know, uh, discussion and back and forth. And I focused in on worlds. We looked at uh, books and series that had a coherent narrative world by speculative fiction authors. So speculative fiction, everything from fantasy and sci-fi all the way over to alternative history, utopian novels, horror, weird tales, and everything in between. And we would look at the, the, the narrative world that was created, which involved some discussion, of course, of plot and character as well, but really looking at the world building, if there is some, in, in those novels or short stories or whatever we are looking at. And then we would talk about the biography and importance of the author, but we'd also get deep into philosophical themes that were being raised by the stories that we were looking at. And we would sometimes use philosophy to try to illuminate that. So in this one, we're going to be talking, as I said, about these two particular novels and the world involved in it. We're also going to talk a bit about Walter Miller's own story. I think understanding that can help you grasp better what is going on in these stories. It adds a richer texture and experience. So we'll talk first about Walter Miller's own life. Walter Miller's biography, I think, is quite helpful for understanding what originated these two novels and why there's such a massive gap in between them, both in terms of years and perhaps also, you might say, in terms of structure, if not setting and theme and, and content. So Walter Miller is born in 1923 in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, and we don't actually know that much about his early years, his biography, in part because he doesn't tell us that much and there aren't a lot of uh, records that biographers have, have come across. We do know that he went to the University of Texas and studied engineering there. That's going to turn up uh, to some degree in some of the discussions in Canticle for Leibowitz. He didn't get a degree. Instead, uh, when World War II is going on, he, he enlists in the Army Air Corps. And at first, he's involved in, in radio. Um, makes sense. Engineering, right? What we would normally nowadays call the Signal Corps. And then something really fateful happened. He was assigned to become a tail gunner. And in the bomber that, that he was in, and bomber crews are very tight and close-knit, um, they flew over Italy. Uh, and sometimes it says <coughs> 53, sometimes they say 55, somewhere in the middle 50 missions. And one of the missions was particularly fateful. It, it, it was the bombing of Monte Cassino, which if you, you know, don't know much about um, the Benedictine order or religious history, probably won't strike you as being that important. But 
it was a monastery that had been established a very, very long time ago by, by St. Benedict, who is the you know, founder of the Benedictine Order, one of the most important orders in Western monasticism, which incorporated things coming from the East. Um, there's a whole story that could be told there. Long story short, uh, Germans, because we were, you know, fighting the, the Germans in Italy at that time had taken up positions, were using it as a, uh, a place for um, their own soldiers. If I remember the story right, it was either for anti-aircraft or artillery, uh, like a spotting station. And so it was targeted for bombardment. Now, this was a, a great loss, of course, because bombing a monastery is reducing it to rubble. And as it turned out, by the time that uh, the bombing raid took place, which Miller was in on, um, the Germans had left. There were just a, a, some monks there and then about 100 or so civilians who had taken refuge there. And it was, you know, in, in many respects, a catastrophe. Valuable uh, uh, artifacts were destroyed, but the loss of human life. And in particular, you could say, uh, non-combatant or even innocent human life, that was, that was a real blow. And that weighed on, on Miller, as we're going to talk about later on. Uh, he comes out of the, the army and he gets married to Anna Louise Becker in 1945, his wife who he would be with except for a brief separation for the uh, remainder of his life. They actually have four children together and you know, we don't, again, we don't know really that much about his biography other than things that people have said. His children are fairly reticent about talking about him. He became kind of a recluse later in his life. Um, his agent actually didn't meet with him face to face for years and years and years. And so, you know, this is kind of a, uh, Tough one to, to say an awful lot about it. But what we can say is that he, in 1953, they did separate, um, and he lived with a, a sci-fi writer, Judith Merrill. Um, that was in between her second and third marriage. So, you know, they were kind of, kind of moving around. In that time, um, they, they were, uh, you know, separated, got back together. And then in um, 1947, uh, uh, Miller converts to Catholicism, and we're going to talk a lot about, about that. And you know, there's discussions about, well, how deep was his conversion and how lasting was it? In any case, he, he did um, enter the, the church at that time. Um, 1950, he's, he's involved in an accident and starts writing. His first story that he writes is not a science fiction story. But then from that point onward, it's all science fiction stories. And he begins sending them out. So from 1951 to 1957, he's, he's writing a, several dozen short stories, which are getting published in the pulps. And he wins a Hugo Award for his um, one of his short stories. Uh, and, and he also, in 1953, he gets into, kind of interesting to find this out, he gets into writing scripts for a very, very early television series called uh, Captain Video and the, the Video Rangers. And so, you know, there's things going on for him at the time. He's, he's married. The, the marriage goes through some, some tough periods. They get back together. He does have continuous work. And then something happens that's going to be really fateful and, and is going to feed into this book. He, he writes the novelettes they're sometimes called really novellas that would end up being the three parts of Canticle for Leibowitz and some people have talked about Canticle for Leibowitz as being a fix-up story now what is a fix-up it's when you take some other stories that you've written and published elsewhere in maybe in serial form or maybe on their own but they're all within the same narrative universe and you kind of patch them up together and hey you've got a you got a story there so a great prime example of this would be A van Volk's um World of Null A right and there's there's lots of other ones out there this isn't really a fix-up, in part because 
according to Miller and according to other people who, who've uh, looked at this, there's a lot of recrafting that goes into it. Characters are renamed. Uh, incidents are placed within larger context. So there, there's, there's a lot going on in that story. And it's eventually published, Canticle for Leibowitz, in, um, officially in 1957. It really starts hitting the shelves in 1960. Wins a Hugo Award. It's not actually being marketed as a sci-fi story, although it's coming out of sci-fi pulps. Um, it's just marketed as a novel. This novel has never been out of print since. And so it really made his reputation and... Um, you know, you can well imagine that after that, people were hoping to see some some new stories come out. And here's where the story of Miller himself takes a rather interesting turn. So he and his wife and kids moved to Daytona, California in 1960, living essentially on the beach. And... Miller is offered a thousand dollar advance to write the sequel to Canticle for Leibowitz. And, you know, that doesn't sound like much money at this point in time, of course. Um, but, and it was a good bit of money back then, but it really wasn't what you would have expected for something that would, had won the Hugo Award and was, you know, going along like gangbusters. He only writes about 50 pages at that time, and then he goes into a a uh, slump and there's a lot of discussion about well what what went on there he becomes kind of a recluse he doesn't go to the sci-fi conventions he doesn't like doing that sort of stuff he really withdraws a lot from everybody as a matter of fact there's a, a very interesting piece out there on the web about somebody who is teaching science fiction in a local community college, I believe it was, or a four-year college in the area who contacted Walter Miller and said, hey, could, you know, I don't want you to like, you know, have to be put on the spot, but could you, could you come into my class and just let my students ask you a few questions? You don't have to give a, a lecture or anything. And Miller said, I'm having writer's block. I, I, I just can't do it. And his agent, um, you know, said that there were really two things that were doing him in. One was depression. The other was, in his agent's words, booze. Nowadays, I think a lot of people can recognize that Miller was probably suffering from some pretty serious PTSD uh, due to his wartime experience. And here's where we come back to the Monte Cassino thing. That stuck with him through the rest of his, his life. And it probably had some role in why he converted to Catholicism, um, why he wrote these things. He actually, at one point in time, said, I was working on the first version of the scene where Zechary, the abbot, lies half buried in the rubble. Then a light bulb came over, came over my head. Good God, is this the abbey at Monte Cassino? What have I been writing? And so, you know, there's a lot going on there. And we don't actually have more than just tantalizing bits of the story, but it, some people talk about him as carrying out a literary exorcism by doing that. Sort of like they've analogized it to Kurt Vonnegut writing Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, I don't think we want to reduce it to that. There's a lot more going on, but that, that certainly plays a role in, in what's happening. And, um, you know, this book, the, the, the follow-up, the second novel, um, takes a long time to produce. Bantam eventually will offer him uh, an advance again and encourage him, and he manages to write 250 pages, and then he gets stuck. And it, the, the, these things go on and on. His agent, you know, is trying to get him to write. And he does manage to eventually, you know, churn stuff out. And what, what's, what we've got here is actually quite good. I'm going to talk about the merits of it in, in just a, a few minutes. Um, but there's a, there's a tragic end to the story. And it, it goes like this. His, his, uh, his wife dies in 1995. And it appears that Miller has most of this written at the time. 
He says that uh, writing after that became even more difficult for him. Um, you know, and, and that it, it just wouldn't work. And so his, his, uh, um, his agent starts looking around for what we call a ghostwriter. A ghostwriter is somebody who takes somebody else's writing and adds their own, you know, stuff to it, sometimes finishes out things, sometimes adds some things in there. And they're trying to, as best as they can, maintain the continuity of style and plot and thought and all these things that go into it. And so they find Terry Bisson and Terry Bisson had worked on a lot of other people's things before that. And Terry Bisson had, of course, read Canticle for Leibowitz. And so he was actually quite thrilled. He talks about this in an article that I'll, I'll link to. Uh, he talks about how thrilled he was to find out that you know, he might be working with Walter Miller and then he found out, well, you won't really be working with him. The agent said, I haven't even seen him face to face. Uh, you're going to work by correspondence. So he gets the, the, the novel and he's like, this is actually pretty good stuff. I'm, I'm not going to have to do that much work to, to finish this up. Um, I'm, I'm happy to work on it. And then Walter Miller kills himself. Actually, the, the way that it, it, it worked, it was in very early 1996. He calls the police. He calls 911 and says, there's a man who's dead here. Um, you're going to want to come and, and check it out. And by the time the police arrive, and it's very quick police response time, he's taken a gun and, and shot himself out on his uh, his lawn. The family wanted to keep it more or less under wraps, and they managed to do so. A few obituaries come out. Of course, Bisson finds out from the agent that, that Miller had, had killed himself. And now the question is, well, what are we going to do with this work? And, and they do uh, manage to finish it up and bring it to press. And there it is. So this is the entirety of the Leibowitz. We'll call them the Leibowitz world and the Leibowitz stories. And they're, they're really quite different from each other. I, I will say a few other things before jumping into talking about the world. So what I want to talk about are, are my sort of personal connection to, to the work and my early um, assessment and how I think, you know, I was wrong about that. And then we'll talk about how these works fit in with each other, but are very different from each other. So I read Canticle for Leibowitz, I believe, the, for the very first time when I was either in high school or college. And, you know, I liked it as a story. I didn't get a lot of the, you know, I didn't get as much out of it as I could have because I didn't understand a lot of the religious stuff and why, why it had to be so focused on that. But there were, there were a lot of cool aspects to it. Rereading it later when I could actually understand what was going on in these discussions and why the characters were acting the way that they, they were, I thought, well, this is a really great book. And I first picked this up, I would say about 15 years ago. And my first read of it, I didn't actually get all the way through it. Uh, you know, I was, I was so primed by how good this had been to read this. And I, I started reading it and I was like, this isn't really what I was looking for. And it seemed like in some respects he'd kind of, kind of slipped, you know, um, but it, it makes sense when you, when you think about, you know, how many decades had passed and how much difference there is between a writer who's, you know, actually quite young doing this and, and a writer who's much more mature writing a, a considerably larger book that has a different structure to it and a very different approach to, let's call it, uh, religious you know, comparative religion, ecumenicity, all those, those sorts of things. And rereading this for this, uh, this talk here, I think this is actually, you know, I don't think it's as good as this, but that's sort of like saying that, um, a really, you know, decent wine is not as great as a, as a really fine wine. This is, this is a good book and it's, uh, it's interesting to read. It's enjoyable. There's a lot going on here. If you started out with this one, I think of course it makes a lot more sense when you're reading the second one. The other thing I'll say about this. So, so structure, right? This, this book is divided into three 
you know, novelettes, Fiat Homo, uh, Fiat Lux, and Fiat Voluntas Tua. Those are Latin for, you know, let there be a human being, let there be light, and let there be, uh, let your will be done, or let there be your will, right? Um, and this is only 200, uh, 300 pages long, 311, I think, to be exact. No, 300, 313. This is one continuous narrative, <clears throat> and it is uh, a good bit longer. It's 434 pages long, and it's centered... Well, it, it, there are other characters who are pretty central in it, but it's really centered around one monk from St. Leibowitz Abbey, uh, Blacktooth, goes by other names as well, Nimi and, and uh, Brother St. George and things like that. Whereas in each of the three novelettes in this one, it's uh, different characters, there's different things going on. It's in, in a way, this is a little bit more like Isaac Asimov's foundation, where a big story is being told from different points of the development of something, something that transcends human beings. In that case, it's the foundation out in space. In this case, it's essentially the, uh, the church and um, the Leibowitzian order and, and what's going on with that. So they're very different in structure. Um, they're not fundamentally different in style, except that you can say that there's a lot of things discussed in this work that wouldn't have been discussed in this work. For example, sexuality uh, of, of all sorts of, uh, you know, different kinds of acts. And, and I mean, it doesn't, he's not going into lurid detail about it, but it does play a role in it. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more space for thinking about different religious perspectives than there is perhaps in, in this one, where it's more about what's going on within monasticism, the larger church, um, and in relation to, say, unbelief or, or, you know, sort of a secular world or something like that. So these are, these are quite different books, um, but they are occupying the same narrative universe. So both of these novels fit solidly into the genre of speculative fiction that we call post-apocalyptic. And, I mean, you could say that there, that's, that's a variety of sci-fi as opposed to, like, say, fantasy or, or horror, but it, it's actually been recognized as its own sort of thing. There's a lot of overlap between these, these different genres. And, I mean, you could also think of it as sort of alternate history in a certain sense as well not least because it's it's so centered around religion in the Catholic Church, and yet this is a story in which Vatican II never happened because it hadn't happened at the time that Walter Miller was writing it. So it's kind of funny to, to think about it. It didn't start out to be a alternate history of the future, but, but it, it in fact winds up being so. So... The, the, the most central backstory stuff is that in this world, they've gone through what they call the flame deluge. And, you know, deluge is, is a, another word for flood. So a, a flood of flames, what does that mean? That means a nuclear war. And it, it destroyed like large parts of the world. This is actually set in the American Southwest for the most part, although they'll talk about like, you know, people up in Oregon or New York, right? That's how they say New York that many years in the future, or even places like, you know, across the sea in, in Asia and all that. But for the most part, it's sent, it's centered in a post-apocalyptic, post-nuclear war um, area of, of the former United States. And <clears throat> so the, the flame deluge happens because according to you know, the records that they have, the um, nations of the time can't get along, they have nuclear weapons, they get stuck in this, you know, essentially 
Cold War first and, and building all these armaments, and then they start thinking about, well, maybe we should strike first, uh, and then it leads to an outright conflagration. Now, a lot of human beings survive, which is, you know, you know, nowadays, I think we would say, yeah, if there's a nuclear war, we're probably all goners because of the winter and fallout and all those sorts of things. Plus, there's so many more nukes now than there, there, there were back then. And they're so devastating. But let, let's just say that human beings do survive, which is the, the case in this story. They're going to be facing a lot of challenges. Society and order has broken down. There's going to be mass casualties. There will be fallout. So people are going to be dying of radiation sickness, which is a horrible way to go. Um, there'll be all sorts of disruptions, even in like, you know, the way rivers flow or the weather patterns. And you don't know what you can eat, what you can't eat. So we just pile up all sorts of things like that. Here's where the second important part of the story comes along. It's called the simplification. So according to Miller, the ordinary people of the time, they're like, well, who is responsible for this catastrophe that we're dealing with? It's the politicians, the scientists, the engineers, all the way down to like, Anybody who's literate. I mean, it, it's sort of like what happened in um, Pol Pot's Campuchea when they were like, you know, if you had eyeglasses, you might you might get killed. In this case, it's anybody who is viewed as being an intellectual or a technician. They they mobs go around and kill them, and there's um, you know there, there's some reaction against this, but. Uh, these people call themselves simpletons, and the idea is let's go back to a, a really basic kind of society, get rid of all these, uh, what they would have at that time called eggheads, all these intellectuals. They just produced this horrible, uh, you know, destroyed world. We're going to rebuild the world, and we're going to rebuild it without any of these jerks. So there's that going on. There's also at the same time a sort of... Uh, as time goes on, um, a attitude towards those who have uh, genetic mutations, uh, freaks, as they'd be called at that time, or sports, um, they try to kill them as, as often as possible. They want to retain, you know, sort of a pure strain of, of human uh, genetic material. And so you've got all that going on. Meanwhile, um, people like... Leibowitz, and his, his full name is Isaac Edward Leibowitz. He is himself a technician. He's somebody who works for the government. He wants to try to find his, his wife. He knows that she was in some fallout shelter in the Southwest. So he goes out to that region. There's an abbey there, and he becomes a monk, basically, so he can go out and look for the, the fallout shelter where his, his wife is supposed to be perhaps alive. And um, after a while, he's like, ah, I think she's, she's probably dead. And he becomes involved with another sort of project. And that project is to keep human knowledge alive. By doing what? By finding books. And in this case, at the very start, hiding them you know, burying them in, in like a grave or something like that in barrels to keep them from being destroyed with the idea that eventually they'll be able to bring them out. And as it turns out, he petitions the Pope to found an order, the Order of St. Albert Magnus, which would be bookleggers, sort of like bootleggers, you know, carried, carried uh, liquor around. These are bookleggers. And they carry books from place to place and hide books. If they get caught, the mob will kill them. And that is, in fact, how uh, Isaac Leibowitz, who's going to eventually become St. Leibowitz, that's, in fact, how he dies. And um, the abbey that the, the story begins at is St. Leibowitz's abbey. He is not yet canonized as a saint. And we have, you know, what we, I should tell you about some of the, the characters and how they, they fit in here. Um, actually, before that, we should talk about a little bit more sort of ethnography and, and the region. So we, we have these monks, right? The church, the Catholic church, has survived. It's going to go through some, some breakups and schisms and other things like that. 
but it survived in part because it's a cohesive institution and because the simpletons, although they might go after individual um, members of the church, are not going after the church en masse, and so it's able to maintain itself. And what we have is essentially something like the Dark Ages, when the church is really the only repository of culture. Meanwhile, in the Southwest, we have these nomadic tribes. And interestingly, they're obviously modeled after Native Americans, but there isn't really any race of, of people at this time. Everything's kind of mixed up together and, um, they're not really taking stock of like, say, skin color or features like that. The biggest thing that they're worried about is, are you genetically human or do you have some, some defects that have been caused by radiation? If that's the case, then you're what they, if, if it's really noticeable, you're what they call a gleb and you're outside of society. These were often early on called the children of the Pope, uh, because, you know, they were supposed to be protected. They were thrown on the mercy of the church. You're not supposed to kill them, but a lot of people were killing them. And then the ones who could pass as full human were called spooks. And they could be any color, any, any sort of, you know, what we nowadays think about as race. So going back to the nomads, there are these people who shift into a nomadic way of life out on the plains, which is, is focused on, uh, at least for the male part, man, horse, dog that trio that that work together and they hunt uh you know animals uh they also herd cattle and they they live off of that you know um they they uh move from place to place the way in which things are set up is matrilineal so that women control the breeding pits for the ponies and uh you know uh, also sort of run the show and then the men, you know, go out and do, do their thing. Um, they develop their own religion, their own sort of ways of doing things. And, and it's very clear, you know, what Miller is doing is sort of modeling them off of the, probably the, you know, the Lakota and some other native tribes with a bit of Mongol mixed in. So that's, that's part of what's going on. There's also states that are arising in different places. And one of them, Texark, Texark, right? Texarkana is going to become very important under the Hannigans, who originally were no, uh, nomads who took over that state, sort of like what happens in, in Mesopotamia early in human history. So Miller, what you see him doing is he's bringing to bear a whole bunch of different themes and saying that things are going to happen in interesting and in similar ways that we can relate to uh, in this new world as they did in the old world. So in Fiat Homo, um, it's, it's set in, you know, around St. Leibowitz's Abbey for the most part. It's before, well, it's before St. Leibowitz is St. Leibowitz, right? And the, the, the main character there is Brother Francis. He is, uh, you know, this, this young guy. I think he's 17 or 18 when, when the story starts. And he, he wants to take his vows. He wants to become a monk of, of, uh, uh, St. Leibowitz, at, or of, 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 of Leibowitz Abbey. And the abbot, Arcos, um, actually denies him over and over again the, the capacity to take his vows because of something that happens. While he's out there in his Lenten fast all by himself, this old pilgrim or wanderer comes by who's going to show up in, in each of these stories over and over again. And he points out uh, something to this, this guy that would be a good stone for putting over um, you know, the other stones. He's trying to protect himself from the, the wolves out there, actually feral dogs. And uh, Brother Francis ends up finding a fallout shelter. And in that fallout shelter, there are these documents that are from Leibowitz. Leibowitz, the founder of their, their order. And so this is a major find. Now, because Leibowitz is being, you know, he's going through the process of canonization, the abbot doesn't want anything to jinx that. And so, you know, there's, there's somebody who comes and is the devil's advocate, you know, trying to poke holes in the story and all, all this. Meanwhile, 
Francis is assigned to the copying room. And this is a very important aspect. This is, and again, this goes back to uh, medieval Europe as well. One of the reasons why we have all, all sorts of secular knowledge as opposed to just, you know, religious texts that we otherwise probably would have lost, like, for example, uh, Seneca and Cicero, is because monks copied out those books. Sometimes actually adding a few things in, sometimes, you know, making beautiful uh, uh, paintings or, or, you know, embellishments on the side, um, sometimes putting crazy stuff in there, like, you know, trees with penises you can find in, in monastic things. Oh, they like to goof around quite a bit, jokes, things like that. Uh, medieval manuscripts are full of uh, really interesting stuff. But the monks were, for the most part, the people who were doing that. Actually, I, I should take that back. It's not just monks. We know that there were also nuns who were involved in this. One reason we know this bit of trivia is... Um, Blue was quite a uh, expensive color to use because you, you had to get lapis lazuli, which came from uh, Central Asia, to, to do it if you really wanted good blue. And they found this, this uh, nun's skull that has la- lapis lazuli in the teeth. Now, why would that be the case? Well, because you licked your, your paintbrush to like get the good fine point on it. Do that enough and stuff starts sticking eventually. So we know that monks and nuns, religious orders, were involved in the copying. And that is what kept knowledge alive. Not just religious stuff, not just philosophical stuff, not just literary stuff, also technical stuff, medical treatises, all these sorts of things would be kept in monasteries. As a matter of fact, what we think of as the Renaissance was in part, you know, new ways of looking at things. It was also scholars going to these monastery libraries where they'd actually lost track of all the stuff that they had in their libraries, finding documents, bringing them out, and then being like, look at this. That was part of the Renaissance as well. Going back to this, um, that's that's part of the backstory of what's going on. And they find things like blueprints, and uh, Brother Francis copies that all out by hand and eventually goes to New Rome, presents some stuff to the Pope, unfortunately dies in, in the story. Then in Fiat Lux, uh, we have another abbot, Abbot Paolo, and he's going to be visited by a secular scholar because now under the Hannigans in Texarch, there is a revival of secular learning going on, a renaissance, right? And um, Than Thaddeo, who is the cousin of Hannigan II, um, comes out to the abbey. He wants to see some of the memorabilia. Actually, he wants to take the memorabilia to his college, but it's not allowed. Meanwhile, Brother uh, Kornhur has managed to create a uh, dynamo, an engine, and a light bulb. And so there's, you know, it's really interesting. Again, parallels what we know about the Middle Ages. It wasn't just like secular scholars, people leaving religion behind that that came up with all of this science. A lot of it was being done in the monasteries, the colleges, the universities, all of these sorts of religious institutions. And then they would go back and forth with it. Um, there's a there's a lot more of the church-state opposition thing going on in there because Hannigan is actually carrying out this process of consolidation that is going to be a, a you know major role in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horse Woman, which is set then about 60 years after uh, Fiat Lux. And we're going to come back to that one in a moment. I just want to round this out with Fiat Voluntas Tua for anybody who's only going to read this book. So in um, Fiat Voluntas Tua, now we're fast-forwarding many, many centuries into the future. We're now in a technological age. As a matter of fact, the world has been repopulated and human beings have even made their way out to the stars into, you know, Alpha Centauri and other places like that. They're colonizing uh, the universe. But they're also moving towards another nuclear war. And that, in fact, is what ends up happening. Um, and, you know, again, St. Saint, Saint Leibowitz's Abbey plays a major role. We have um, uh, the abbot who now is Jethras uh, 
uh, Zerke, who we saw mentioned earlier when, when uh, um, Miller is talking about Monte Cassino and he's, he's writing about what happens to Zerke, getting caught in the rubble, and he's like, is this what was going on? Am I writing this, this story? There's also a doctor who's involved, who's sort of the equivalent of Thon Thaddeo, you know, the secular uh, thing. And they, and they argue back and forth about their positions. Um, there's also Brother Joshua, who's going to be leading the, uh, let's call it the, the remnant. Because what ends up happening is they, the, the Vatican, the new Rome, has planned for not just monks and priests, but three bishops to go out into space so that the church can continue on ministering to the um, colonists in other worlds and transmitting not just the religion, but also the, hum- you know, sort of hu- humane perspectives and the knowledge. As a matter of fact, you know, the, the, the uh, order of... of uh, uh, the, the St. Leibowitz's Abbey, um, and St. Leibowitz's Abbey itself is, is heavily populated by spacemen, by people who have previous experience in going out into space. So that's, that's part of what's going on with, with that story. The world is being split between an Asian coalition and Atlantic Confederacy. Not too hard to read between the lines and see what's going on there. Now, when we get to St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman, we get a lot more in-depth discussion about what's going on. And it's, uh, you know, Texarc is trying to take over the entire area. As a matter of fact, they, they're even trying to take the, the papacy so that they can control uh, the religion and have church and state kind of unified in the same. And there's a lot more discussion about the nomads, in part because we have several characters who themselves are nomads, including the main character, um, Blacktooth, and then uh, the person who starts out as being the, the Red Cardinal and eventually is going to become Pope, um, Brown Pony, and many others. Now, there's a passage here that I, I, I would like to read that I think is quite good for talking about um, what was going on with the, the nomads. And um, I'll read it here. So, the future was revealed to the tribal seers. It was foreseeable that the open plains would shrink and the people on the, and the cattle on it would either perish or change. They had been changing continuously through three generations since the conquest. Uh, he goes on, for whatever reason, the Great Plains were shrinking while their population had been growing fast of late. Was this not the chief cause of war? The tribes were restless, anxious, angry. They'd compromised. Even the wildest among them used the tools and weapons that were manufactured in the towns and cities to the east and in the mountains. They brought their beef hides, artwork, wolf skins, bear grease, and surplus ponies to a trading post, then rode back to grandmother land leading a pack mule loaded with tools, gunpowder, musket balls, fabric, beans, and enough distilled spirits for at least the elders to get sloshed. They sang the old songs and danced the old rituals, honored the wild people, moved their dwellings and their herds according to the season. Each horde or owned a sacred path and sacred places along it to pitch camp for a season. They navigated the grasslands by the doings in the night sky as much as by landmarks. The sky told them when to move south. It was the middle of the 23rd century, and Polaris traced a larger circle in the north sky than it did in the time of Leibowitz, but the hordes called themselves the people of the Pole Star when they wandered. And so this is, you know, part of uh, what's going on. The, um, the it, it, it's an entire world that is now being sort of revealed to us in this. And it's a world that in, involves, you know, machinations of church and state and politics and, you know, whether the tribes or the hordes can be united under one chieftain, you know, essentially one war leader, because who actually holds power? The, the grandmothers, right? Uh, the people up in the hills, and whether the, the people who have suffered genetic defects can live a full life themselves, or whether they're always going to be persecuted and driven out. There's all these things going on. As a matter of fact, even connections to lands across the sea in this book. So there's a lot more world building, you could say, going on 
than the brief sketches that we're getting in, in this book. And, and I think they do make very nice companion pieces to each other, given that. Now we should talk about some philosophical themes of this work. Although I don't think it's really the most interesting philosophical theme posed by the work, much of the secondary literature and writing and, and talk about this work focuses on one that we really should discuss, and that is the notion of there being sort of a cyclical approach to history and, and perhaps even to time on the part of Walter Miller. So what do we mean by talking about cyclical history? So the idea is that history follows a certain pattern and you can get to a certain point and think that you might be changing things, but you're really caught in this dynamic where you're going to wind up at the same place as the last cycle. And this is quite a popular view of history. You know, those who like to, you know, talk about America as the new Rome and how, you know, the Roman Empire fell to these things. And it all depends on whose um, uh, version of Roman history you're going to, you're going to look at, right? Uh, you know, so if you're a Walter, if you're, if you're a Gibbon person, then, you know, you, you stress these things. If you, uh, look at other things, you stress other factors. But the idea is that you can have the same basic dynamic happening over and over again. And it doesn't really work that way. Every time that you look closely at these, you see that at best what we have are circles that overlap to some degree, but aren't exactly the same cycle. If you want to simplify so that you actually get away from history and you're dealing with something more like mythology or ideology, well, then you can have as, as you know, easy a uh, circle as you want. Now, what would be the cycle for Miller's story? So if you use Canticle for Leibowitz, it's pretty straightforward. You've got a big cataclysm. Uh, something destroys society, including uh, the, you know, the actions of human beings, both those who like unleash terrible weapons. And it doesn't necessarily have to be weapons. It could be environmental disaster. It could be whatever. And then you have the other humans responding to it in ways that are not particularly helpful and actually make things worse. The simpletons. And then you rise out of that. Uh, by, by means of having some sort of cohesive community that has greater values than just eat and drink and, and, you know, copulate and, and reproduce something else that they're devoted to that produces knowledge as kind of a side effect and the knowledge begins to spread and, and, you know, you, you essentially come to the point where you leave the dark ages and get in, you get through the high middle ages and the Renaissance and this, you know, great flowering of things. And then you move into another modern period and then you get to a late modern period where everybody's, you know, got it, you know, fairly easy, but we create new weapons and we don't control them and, and we, we haven't really learned the lessons of history and then we blow it all up again. Right. Except that in this case, um, they did learn the lesson. The church and, and the, the people who have colonized elsewhere, they get the hell out of town. They're like, we know where this goes. You know, uh, it, it really was a bad thing to blow up the world last time. Th this time, maybe nothing's going to survive. And actually, by the end of the story, I'll just read this to you. So here's the two vignettes that end it. They sang as they lifted the children into the ship. They sang old space chanties and helped the children up the ladder one at a time and into the hands of the sisters. They sang heartily to dispel the fright of the little ones. When the horizon erupted, the singing stopped. They passed the last child into the ship. The horizon came alive with flashes as the monks mounted the ladder. The horizons became a red glow. A distant cloud bank was born where no cloud had been. The monks on the ladder looked away from the flashes. When the flashes were gone, they looked back. The visage of Lucifer mushroomed into hideousness above the cloud bank, rising slowly like some titan climbing to its feet after ages of imprisonment in the earth. Someone barked an order. The monks began climbing again. Soon they were all inside the ship. The last monk, upon entering, paused in the lock. He stood in the open hatchway and took off his sandals. Sic transit mundus. 
he murmured, looking back at the glow. Thus goes the world, right? He slapped the soles of his sandals together, beating the dirt out of them. The glow was engulfing a third of the heavens. He scratched his beard, took one look at the ocean, and stepped back and closed the hatch. There came a blur, a glare of light, a high, thin, whining so sound, and the starship thrust itself heavenward. So, you know, he, there is a cyclical element to that. We've learned our lesson, but the other part is, let's get the hell out of here, you know, and let's, let's move on with hope for humanity, remaining humanity. I mean, remember, the first one, the first story is called Fiat Homo, let there be human. I mean, let there be man is how a lot of people would translate it. Let there be humanity, right? The second part is this. The breakers beat monotonously at the shores, casting up driftwood. An abandoned seaplane floated beneath, beyond the breakers. After a while, the breakers caught the seaplane and threw it on the shore with the driftwood. It tilted and fractured a wing. There were shrimp carousing in the breakers and the whiting that fed on the shrimp and the shark that munched the whiting and found them admirable in the sport of brutality of the sea. A wind came across the ocean, sweeping with it a pall of fine white ash. The ash fell into the sea and into the breakers. The breakers washed dead shrimp ashore with the driftwood. Then they washed up the whiting. The shark swam out to his deepest waters and brooded in the old clean currents. He was very hungry that season. We don't know whether life has completely ended on Earth, but much of it has. And so the cycle, I mean, if it is a cyclical history, it's like, Wow, you, you know, last time you really screwed it up, this time it's done. So, you know, we could talk about cyclical history, and we could also talk about, you know, repetition of historical motifs in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman. Um, what we have here is a discussion about, you know, uh, church politics and the, re the relation between church and state and how those things seem to repeat themselves. You know, there's, there's schisms, there's, uh, you know, attempts by the, the secular world to, to take the church and turn it to its own ends by controlling who is elected as Pope, who gets to be a cardinal, all of those sorts of things. And, uh, religious people being confronted with, you know, all sorts of possibilities. Should I, should I, sell out to the state? Should I try to help these people over here? What's the right path for the church to go? All of those sorts of things. So people want to read those, those matters into it. I would say we're dealing less with a completely cyclical motif of history and more with Miller trying to tell us this is how we could screw things up. Some people have pointed out that there's nothing inherent about the technology itself for Miller that brings us to, to the, these issues, uh, whether of, of domination by some, some tyrant uh, or of uh, destruction of the, the world that we all have to live in through the use of, of uh, weapons. And he doesn't just talk about um, nuclear weapons. There's also the use of biological weapons in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman. As a matter of fact, even in this, in the uh, Fiat uh, looks, the Hannigan uses biological warfare against the nomads to break them, to kill their, their uh, um, cattle. In St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman, it's used, biological weapons are used against people by, by the, uh, Texarch forces. So I think that, that, um, again, it's, it's better to talk less of directly cyclical history where we don't have any choices and it's more thinking about cautionary history, right? Um, the technology by itself isn't necessarily good or bad. As a matter of fact, some people call uh, Miller a uh, technophile, saying that technology is actually a good thing, but we have to be very careful about thinking that technology by itself, without changing the human condition, changing the human heart, changing the way our societies work, is automatically going to make things better and not simply, say, replicate power structures or domination or exploitation or conflicts that are going to take place for us.
A second philosophical theme that I would say is absolutely central and inescapable in these, these two novels is the meaning and role of religion. I mean, this is all happening at a monastery and at least, you know, a third of the important characters in this story, including the two most important characters, uh, Blacktooth and Brown Pony are religious. So, you know, what is Miller doing by, by thematizing religion? Part of what's going on, I think, is, and you can see this with the, the vast array of characters, you know, when we, when we generalize about religion, and particularly when we generalize about the church, meaning the Catholic church, and about monks, we're actually engaging in something that's that's kind of sloppy thinking a, a lot of the time and we have to be careful that we're not painting as we say with too broad a brush every monastery if you ever read monastic literature you you very quickly come to realize that people become monks or nuns for very different reasons and have very different experiences and one monastery is not, even though they're under the same rule, say Benedict's rule, they interpret it differently and apply it differently. And there's different things going on. So, you know, you, you don't go to a monastery to escape the human condition. You wind up entrapped in it even more and, and you know, sort of trying to understand it all the more in, in a monastery. Even if you go out to the desert by yourself as a hermit, you can't escape the human condition. So figuring out the meaning and the, the value and the demands of religion is, in fact, a major part of this. And, and you have characters. This is part of what I really like about um, the work. In, in some respects, he reminds me of other authors like Iris Murdoch or Evelyn Waugh or Graham Greene, where becoming religious or being religious does not solve your problems for you. It actually complicates your, your existence. And you have all sorts of things where you know what you know the teaching is, but then how, how to apply it, what's the right thing to do. Um, and, and And there are people who are in it as, as examples, you know, Black Tooth is a prime example who are religious and they do follow as best as they can what's being taught or what they've internalized as their religion, but they're doing it poorly and they know it to be the case. You know, poor, poor Black Tooth over and over again has so many, so many hard, uh, uh, situations. He does in fact find a teacher in uh, Amon Speckelbird, the, who becomes Pope and who is who's almost very much, I, I think is really modeled after like a Zen abbot because uh, Miller got into Eastern religions quite a bit. So let's talk about what religions are mentioned or, or play a role in this. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how one lives out monastic life and the importance of vows. There's, there's really, I think there's some really great sort of representations of um, some of the sacraments in, in this, you know, what's going on when somebody confesses and, you know, what counts as, as a good one. There's baptism being discussed. As a matter of fact, the um, final story, the Fiat Voluntas Tua, um, ends with uh, an attempt by the abbot to baptize what what's essentially like a child who's grown out of this this woman um and the child doesn't doesn't allow it but does take the eucharist the you know the bread um so there's a lot of of, of that sort of stuff and there's also sacramentality i would say of of other sorts you know there's some some sacramental engagements with the um nomads religion, which seems to be modeled, again, off of um, some Native American uh, things with, with again, some, some Eastern things mixed in there as well. And then there's discussions of others. So we, we actually should talk about not just, um, you know, the, the, the church in relation to the nomads, but we should talk about the, the whole range of religion that, that's being presented and explored in this. So we, we do have lots and lots of discussion about 
Catholicism. Um, and we do have quite a bit of discussion about what's going on within different things in the, the nomad religion, including belief systems, where there's, uh, for example, a threefold aspect to one of the divine beings who's present as the night hag, uh, the, uh, the maiden, and also as the vulture of, of war, right? Um, so there's, there's all of these things figured into it. But there's also, interestingly, not, not in the first novel, but in the second novel, there's a lot of stuff that if you've been reading, you know, <clears throat> if you've been reading Buddhist in, in particular Zen literature, you'll come to recognize in some of the discussions that people are having, particularly the Pope Amon Speckleberg, who is a mystic, right? You'll also recognize, if you've ever read Meister Eckhart, some discussions uh, coming up in there. Um, and then there's, there's also Eastern religions brought in in a kind of vague way. You know, there are these um, warriors who are Asian in origin, came from a church over there, wind up being part of a cardinal's um, retinue or, or, you know, bodyguards. And they are essentially warrior monks. They, they teach other monks how to fight too as well. It's never quite clear what their status actually is and where they came from. That's, that's not really narrated. And then there's also another character, Wuxin, who plays an important role in it as well, who used to be the executioner for the Hannigan, the, the Texarch uh, authority guy, and who then, um, you know, leaves. He's, he's sort of under disgrace, and he's sort of a weapon master. And he gets a lot of lines in there where he talks about, you know, a sword taking life, but also giving life. And, and there's a, you know, as, as um, both brown pony and as uh, Blacktooth can, can, can easily realize and identify and tell us in the story, there is um, a spirituality involved there. So what's, what's really interesting is that Miller doesn't dogmatize. What Miller does in his stories, and he doesn't didacticize either. He doesn't tell you a story about the good monk and the bad monk, and you know who the good monk is and who the bad monk is, and you know very clear by the end of the story what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. He doesn't do that sort of thing. In many respects, he's like Philip K. Dick or or like Iris Murdoch in 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 or Graham Greene, putting these characters out there. Another person he's like in this this respect, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Characters are, are there. They're trying to figure out their own salvation or duties or relationships. And they've got religious guidance, which is sometimes helpful, sometimes not. They know that they have to, to act and, and make choices. This is another issue that we're going to come to in a bit. And they wind up, you know, sort of communicating a perspective that I think Walter Miller himself has. Now, interestingly... We mentioned that, you know, Miller had converted to Catholicism, and I, I said, nobody's really quite sure how stable, how deep a conversion this, this actually was or would turn out to be. He writes a letter to the editor of a local paper shortly after his wife's death, where he says that Eastern religions make it clear that personhood is an illusion— and he talks about his wife as, you know, if she exists at all, it's within, you know, me. And, you know, um, she had a, she, you know, is a great person, but also had a mean streak. And then he says, but I've, I've also got enough, a, a mean streak and I've got enough room for both of our mean streaks. And the idea that he, that he seems to be conveying there is, it, it, there's twofold, right? There's the sort of, endorsement, I think, on his part of a less personal centered, more, you know, traditional Buddhist uh, conception of, of human beings. And then there's also this, well, we carry the people around with us 
in our hearts in in you know how we we care about them or something something along those lines you could say and um you know, I think that's, 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 that's quite meaningful. So religion is going to play a really central role in this, but it's not as if there's something that you can point at and simply say, aha, there's the essence of religion. Rather, religion is being explored in, in not in every single possible aspect of it, but in many, many central aspects of it and in several different representative faiths in Walter Miller's works. I think that a third important theme of these two novels by Walter Miller Jr. is the, let's call it the distinction, but also overlapping and intersection of, of three important areas of human existence, part, part of what makes us human. And one of these is the political sphere. And that's where a lot of different things are going on that we'll talk about in just a moment. Another is the sphere of religion, including religious institutions. So not just people having beliefs, but actually having some sort of organization to it, whether it be the, the nomads out on the plains or the actual church itself, you know, having survived the flame deluge and having, you know, uh, ecclesial structures, but also monastic structures. And then the third thing we could, we could call the realm of technology and science. And, and maybe we actually should distinguish those two apart from each other because there's, an, there's a tendency to blur them together. And all three of them appeal to really basic, fundamental human needs, desires, experiences. So, you know, let's come back to the, the political, right? We, we have to live together in community. As Aristotle says, we are a political or social animal, meaning that we, we have relations not just with our immediate families, but with neighbors, with people who we live with, and with larger people inhabiting larger spheres in which we have some things in common, and in which we also disagree about certain moral values. And, and you see that, you know, really, especially in, in this, you know, follow-up novel, but it's also there in Canticle for Leibowitz in st as well. And when things can't be done properly, when things go off the rails in the political sphere, that's when everybody else suffers, particularly when those making the decisions have uh, been armed by, you know, the scientists or the technologists. And so that's, that's a really, you know, key idea. There are people who are, you could say, political creatures. So, for example, in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horse Woman, um, Nimi or, or Blacktooth He's not really a political person. He's he's a religious person who also feels some you know some allegiances to the nomads where he came from, and he falls in love with uh, somebody else. We'll talk about that in just a bit in in another theme with Eldra. Um, but Brown Pony is, is totally a political animal. He just happens to also be a cardinal and to be within the ecclesi ecclesial structure. And then he ends up being Pope for a while, although not acknowledged by the, the Hannigans and the Texarch forces. Um, and the, the person who was elected Pope prior to him, uh, Amon Speckelbird, he is, he's a mystic, right? So he's, he's a religious person. He's not actually a political person, but it gets steered in, in political ways. And so there's all these things going on. And what is politics fundamentally about? You could say that part of it is about human competition with each other. Who's going to run things? Who's going to, to rule? Who's going to call the shots? And, and when things degenerate into just rival factions, then we've got some serious problems. But the political is also about how do we live together as human beings? How do we orient ourselves towards securing certain basic goods that we need? How do we handle conflicts within the community and conflicts of the community with larger 
forces uh, other communities in many cases. How do we deal with that? And then, you know, as Aristotle pointed out as well, the the political sphere is is partly where we decide what things are going to be studied. So it impinges upon the technological sphere. It impinges upon the scientific sphere. And we can say that the religious sphere does that as well. So let, let's also talk about the, the religious sphere. Obviously, we're, we're looking at um, religious institutions in Canticle for Leibowitz. It's uh, monks and abbots who are the main characters in each of the three stories. And of course, they play a major role in this, but we do also have some people who are not religious or don't start out as religious as important characters in St. Leibowitz and the, the Wild Horsewoman. And we have other religious structures and organizations being brought in as well. Those in particular of the nomads out on the plains where it's connected together with their politics in, in different ways than it is with the, um, you know, the city states and the Texarch empire and, and the church. The other thing that we haven't talked about so far, other than to say, well, maybe we need to make a distinction here, is the scientific and technological sphere. You know, as human beings, we are technological creatures. You could look at language itself as being technology, and we've been supplementing the what our bodies are for you know, for centuries and centuries. Using a crutch is, is a form of technology. Um, so we are creatures who, who don't exist without some sort of connection with technology. But you can use technology without actually understanding it or understanding the effects that it's going to have or how to fix it. And part of what's going on in these, these stories is a history of technological recovery and misunderstanding and then, you know, recuperation and inventing new things. And it's interesting in the second story in, in Fiat Looks that there are some things that are being recovered from before the flame deluge, right? Like for example, the circuit that uh, Brother Francis, uh, you know, traces out and, and illuminates. But there's other things that are being invented, uh, grasped that weren't coming from the flame deluge. They might be repetitions of things that were lost from the previous civilization, right? But they, they're they also the product of human ingenuity. And you can say, well, why do people create technology? And there's, there's actually a couple different answers to that that I think are quite relevant here. One is people see a need and they're like, man, I wish I had something that could do this, right? And so, you know, if you think about in, in um, Fiat Lux, the uh, light, you know, filaments, the, the essentially light bulb and the generator that's being produced, it is, um, it's, it's being done in order to illuminate the manuscript room. So it's got a very practical utilitarian purpose. Yet at the same time, um, brother, what was his name? Uh, Kern, um, there we go. Yeah, brother uh, Kerner. He invents the dynamo not because it's to satisfy some need, but there's an intellectual curiosity there. Also, a use of intuition, as uh, the the scientist recognizes, that allows him to explore. And this is part of what makes us human. We we have a desire to understand, to experiment, and to to know, to have knowledge. And science is really, in, in part, not just about finding practical applications, but about figuring stuff out. And the church could get in the way of that, or the church could promote that. And it, it can be, you know, not just the church as a whole, but individual monasteries or abbots or you know, other things within it can promote or stand in the way of, of that. The, the, the narrative historically of um, religion and science has never been so simple as religion is simply holding science back. That was, you know, nonsense that was created during the Enlightenment to try, you know, sort of justify throwing away the past. And Miller is really playing with this. Likewise, there's an interpenetration of the religious 
and the political sphere. We see that very, very clearly in all the machinations going on in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman, where they're, they're you know, essentially uh, competing about who's going to rule the church. Um, so I think that's another really key aspect of this, this narrative. A fourth theme that we could call an ethical theme is something that the characters themselves are undergoing and taking part in in these stories, and that's that they have to make choices, and usually they're trying to make you know good choices, at least the characters who are being narrated and who are telling us about their motivations and things like that. And these, these choices have to do with values, and they also have to deal with what we can call loyalty to something something transcendent, something greater than them. And so this ties in very closely with this, the third theme that we just talked about, you know, the intersection of the political sphere, the religious sphere, and then the scientific and technological sphere, which might actually be two different spheres. In each of these cases, there's, there's something that is not just pure self-interest in the sense of like survival or getting rich or having power over people. The political and the religious could be about that. So could the technological. But the people who are being driven by these and, and who have genuine you know, dilemmas to deal with, it's not just about those. And it's not just about vanity either. These things that are, that are really self-centered. It's not totally removed from it either. And, and actually in this, this one, Blacktooth you know, is, is really going through a lot trying to fathom you know, whether his, his motives are good motives or, or not. And I, I think you can say something similar is happening with the characters in Canticle for Leibowitz as well. So over and over again, people have to, to make decisions and take stands that can often get them put in danger or even killed, coming into conflict over things that they think to be bigger than them and to make demands upon them. So each of the abbots, for example, in Canticle for Leibowitz and in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman, they have a number of different imperatives in mind. An abbot is somebody who rules the monastery. In fact, in the Catholic Church, they have the same power within the monastery as a bishop has over their diocese. And so, you know, they have to make a lot of difficult decisions, and that's why they're elected to become abbot. Every monastery is a microcosm of human beings with all sorts of problems arising, conflicts between the monks and what they think ought to be done, and the abbots have to, to figure out how to, how to deal with that. As a matter of fact, the one abbot actually has like a, essentially like a stomach ulcer because of all of these responsibilities on him that he has to, to deal with. And you can say similar things about the popes, you know, in, in uh, wild, you know, St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman. Also the, the, um, the pope who made the decision to send off the clergy and children and the, uh, um, the bishops into space. You know, they're having to plan providentially and they're having to take difficult stands, which may in fact, and in the case of some of these characters, do get them killed or result in them maybe feeling like they're wasting their, their life. I think, you know, what's really interesting is in the case of Canticle for Leibowitz, everybody's basically making the right decisions. They're not viewed as right necessarily by everybody around them, you know, great example of this is Brother Francis engaging in this illuminated manuscript and the robber who takes it away from him says, you wasted all those years of your life on this? And Brother Francis kind of, there's a moment where he's like, yeah, maybe it was a waste of my, my time. I mean, it, what makes it a waste is that this stupid robber took it away from me. And then, you know, he goes and, and, and sees the, the Pope and the Pope gives him some money to buy it back. And of course, Brother Francis isn't able to because, spoiler alert, he gets killed. Um, and he gets killed basically so, so somebody else can eat him. But, does that mean that the sacrifice is simply in vain? I think the message that Walter Miller is giving us 
in what each of these characters is doing is, you know, you can't guarantee that what you do is actually going to turn out to, to have, you know, the effects that you want. But it can all be done, if not, you know, for the greater glory of God, for the gl greater glory of something at least, some, something that has a transcendent value. It could be God, it could be comradeship, it could be the community, it could be truth, it could be progress. There's all sorts of possibilities, but we see characters who are, in fact, devoted to it. And we see characters you know, doing similar things in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman, the d different nomads who, you know, some of them are trying to unite their peoples, um, the, the, the genetically uh, affected people living up in the hills who are trying to produce their own community where their kind can live. Even the, the, the Hannigan is, you know, who, who runs the ostensibly evil empire of Texarkana, who does do some pretty underhanded stuff, like biological weaponry and all of that. He's, he's not a totally bad person in this. He's trying to produce a, you know, a greater civilization. And so you've got all these people who are making these important decisions. And then we have Blacktooth, Nimi, Brother St. George. All these are names for the same guy. And he has to make similar decisions over and over and over again, where his loyalties truly lie. And he makes a lot of uh, good decisions, and he also makes, in, in his own you know, view, in retrospect, some bad decisions. And sometimes he'll like go to confession and talk about that. <laughs> sometimes he's absolved, sometimes he, he isn't. Um, but I think that that's, that's a really cool thread. You could call it an ethical motif running throughout this, this work, and of course, this work as well. So the last big theme that I want to talk about really doesn't run through Canticle for, uh, for Leibowitz at all, but it does figure heavily in St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horse Woman. And it's, it's something that I, I might be wrong about this, but I think that Miller is weaving in um, a, a tale of lovers who can't truly be together in part because although they do love each other and they do in fact have a kid together and all these, these things, you know, are, are going on and they're able to, to be together for a while. The, the situation, it, it just doesn't work out. And the, the requirements after, you know, because uh, the one of them is a monk and then the other one becomes a nun, those are going to keep them apart as well. And now if you know the story of Eloise Dargentail and Abelard, I think you can recognize some common elements in the connection between Blacktooth or Nimi and Adra, who is a, a spook. She's a genetically um, modified person who uh, can pass as, as fully human. And um, she's not supposed to reproduce. Uh, as a matter of fact, she has her, her genitalia sewn up so that uh, you know she's not going to be able to do that. Her father's the the one who who commissions that because they're not supposed to do that. And um, she and and Blacktooth end up meeting very early on in the thing. And she steals his rosary. She steals his guitar. She kind of taunts him. And they both desire each other. And they wind up together. And they they do some other things, you know, because they can't have. Um, what we, we might call normal procreative conjugal love kind of sex that, that, you know, is, is uh, normative in this case. And um, she does manage actually later on to get herself pregnant uh, through, you know, some, some interesting means that you can read about in there. But what, what's really, I think, interesting about this is that she is actually an agent for her people working with the, the Vatican and against the um, the empire, the Texar Texarchs, um, the, you know, so she's really, you know, she's smart, she's beautiful, she's uh, attractive to Blacktooth. She is attracted to Blacktooth. They want, they have a destiny together in a way, and yet they can't be together. Over and over again, uh, the cardinal and then the pope. Um, 
Brown Pony says, you stay away from her, right? Don't, don't get involved uh, with this, this woman. And over and over again, uh, they, they do wind up being together. And she has a child, sort of like, you know, Eloise and Abelard had a child who Eloise named uh, Astrolabe. She was so into the science of the time. They were both brilliant scholars, by the way. And the, the child is, is given up. Um, and, and likewise, the same thing happens to Blacktooth and Eldra's child. Uh, and he tries to track it down. Is he's unsuccessful in that? And you know, I, I think this is a good fitting place to end. The very end of this is um, after everything has collapsed and all the plans have broken down. Um, Blacktooth survives, and um, here we go. He rode unchallenged past the first log outpost of the Glep. He hoped the Valley of the Mistborn would take him in, and it did. The Valley, or the Wachita Nation as it was now called, had grown to be a network of valleys up and down the low mountains called the Old Zarks. Blacktooth wandered until he found a little community of bookleggers and memorizers called Post Cedar. He traded his mule for a guitar, much like his father had given him, and lived on the mountainside above the abbey, swapping his services as a scribe and a tutor for food. He found shelter in a rock house cave, very much like the cave where Amen had lived, except that these eastern caves were broad and open like a mouth. They, protect, they provide protection against the rain and some against the cold, but none against the years. And so Blacktooth St. George grew old, reciting the divine office and meditating upon the rule of St. Leibowitz, which enjoined him to the humility he was surprised to discover had been waiting for him all along. It was a sister to the deep loneliness he treasured, a loneliness he no longer wished filled. It was an emptiness as tangible as love. Some nights, though, he found himself praying to whatever might answer such a prayer that Adra would come to him. He had heard that a blonde spook who wore a nun's robe practiced medicine in the next valley. The local priest called her a witch. Sometimes she healed minds the priest had cursed, and because of this, the priest feared her. And, you know, it goes down a little bit. Um, here we go. And... Um, Blacktooth, you know, eventually dies. And then the last chapter, just over the mountain from Post Cedar was a convent where there lived a nun known as Sister Claire. She awakened one morning with one of her feelings and knew that the hermit who lived in the next valley was dead. She'd known of him for years, but had elected to leave him in peace, knowing the difficulty of the journey he was on. No one told her he was dead. No one besides herself knew it yet. And she only knew because of the feeling not unlike joy and not unlike sorrow either that wouldn't leave her. She welcomed the feeling the hermit had few enough left in this world to miss him. With the abbess's permission, Sister Claire packed a loaf of bread, a little cheese, and then as an afterthought, a freshly dead mouse from the trap in the kitchen. She walked over the steep and little used trail to Post Cedar on the far side of the valley, across from the monastery. She found the narrow path to the dry cave just where she knew it would be. The old man hadn't been dead long. It was not his death, but his age that filled Sister Claire's eyes with tears. She had expected somehow to find a handsome young man, even though she was herself an old woman bent and spotted with years. Blacktooth was sitting against a stone with the head of a small cougar in his lap. The animal lifted its blue head when she approached. It was Librata. Adra waited, but the cougar wouldn't leave, and finally had to be coaxed away with the mouse so that she could bury Blacktooth and place at the head of his grave the little cross she carried with her all these years. The rosary that was clutched in his hand and the crude guitar he had left leaning against the back wall of the cave she took with her. And that's, wh that's where it ends. Sad. Um, hard to, you know, bring everything to a close that way, but that's, that's, the, that's the story. And what we have here is a, um, in addition to all the other themes that are going on, a kind of Eloise and Ambelard tragic lover story as well coming from the middle ages so that's uh what we have to say about these two excellent novels i hope you read them and uh, get as much out of them as i have on the rereading